To try and present a holy man as a model would be a futile attempt. Rather, to see him in his uniqueness as one would contemplate a river, a mountain or a gushing stream would be in keeping with our time. I feel an irresistible call, yet I fear my boldness in binding myself for life. I can neither convince myself nor imagine that I shall end this year in a monastery. Yet if I give up the religious life for good, what a loss. My soul is ambitious. That is surely allowed when the quest is for God. I hope I shall not be disappointed. Chapter 1 The Break I do understand, my dear Henry, I do understand your happiness since you are now where God wanted you. You too will understand that your mother is only a poor woman who for the last 19 years has done her best to spoil her little boy, but now my little one has left and will only come back so rarely. Well, it is a letter which our mother wrote to Henry soon after he left for Kergonon. He was 19. If I were a better Christian, I know that I would have resigned myself sooner, but it will come in time, I hope. You will pray so much for us, my dear, that the good Lord will surely give me the heart to bear such a trial. Dearest Henry, I believe that I love you more than ever. Your mother. My God, how deeply I was struck by your letter yesterday. In spite of all, I cannot get used to the idea that my Henry is a Benedictine. I can hardly pronounce the word.
Saint Gregory, in his life of Saint Benedict, has a phrase which, in my view, is the fundamental watchword of the monk. Alone, in the sight of the supreme witness, he abode with himself. At last, I can see that the enterprise, which for 13 years has been in my thought and ceaseless prayer, is about to take shape, namely, the establishment of monastic life in India. Our starting point should be the rule of Saint Benedict, for there we have a sound monastic tradition which would save us launching out into the unknown. You will understand that 18 years of Benedictine life have deeply attached me to the holy rule and that my dream is to give our blessed father new children who will fashion a Christian India just as the elder brothers fashion a Christian Europe. On this basis, I foresee the development of a Hindu version of Benedictine hospitality in the form of an ashram where Hindus and Christians alike would come to seek nourishment for their spiritual life. Fifteenth of January, 1949. Did I tell you that I have my eye on a mango grove, which is right on the bank of the river Cavery, well screened by trees? It's truly a hermit's life that we are leading here. I have found a very lonely spot where I dream of building my hut. I suspect that in my great love of the Kaveri, all my old daydreams before the vastness and the peace of the ocean are coming back to me, and that the delight with which I stretch myself on the sands of the Kaveri renews deep down in me the joys shared long ago on the beaches of my childhood. 1950, South India, setting up with Jules Monchana of a Christian ashram, Shantivanam. I could never have imagined that my dreams of 1934 would be so literally fulfilled. Present successor, Bede Griffith, Benedictine. Some people frankly criticize us. And they know we are living in the 20th century. Those poor priests, how sad to see them becoming Hindus. We are taken for real tapasvi, ascetics. Actually, the bus passes only 300 yards from our huts, and our food is lavish in comparison with the local standard. I dream of one day tramping the roads and staying in Hindu villages, giving my witness as a Christian monk. 
Many people here are acquainted with Christ and speak of him with deep respect. But between that and the recognition of him as God, there is a vast gulf. How can I make them understand that Christ is the only Son of God and the only way of salvation? Arunachala. Here, sages have lived and have imbued the very rocks with their spiritual life, and even more with the mystery of a presence. I regard this stay at the holy mountain as an initiation into Indian monastic life. I had, of course, heard people speaking of Ramana Maharshi, who had lived there for more than 50 years. I gazed intensely at this old man of 70, with his gentle face and beautiful eyes. But what lay behind them? In every action, in all willing, in all thinking, ask yourself a question. Who is thinking? Who is willing? Who is acting? Who am I? It was a call which pierced through everything, rent it in pieces, and opened a mighty abyss. Twenty-sixth of December, 1951. I have celebrated Christmas all alone in my wood, but on such a day, how painful it is to feel that my beloved brothers do not share in the profound joy which I feel in the depth of my heart. The further I go, the more I feel this gulf between Hindu brothers and myself, the church. I'd like to throw a bridge across it, but don't know where to fasten it. The walls are too smooth. Next spring, I can again respond to the call of the mountain. My friends misunderstand its attraction for me. Reached Tiru on March 4th. Moved into a cave on the 5th. Evening. There is a mystery about Arunachala. Solitude, silence, poverty. In my practice of all this, up till now, I have merely been playing at it. Here I meet with the real thing, and I am becoming aware of what I need if my experience is to be complete.
call to total poverty, which is the call to total freedom. For the only man who is free is he who has nothing, absolutely nothing, that he can call his own. A few months earlier, I had adopted the robe of the sannyasi, the sign in India of ultimate renunciation. Perhaps, if I had waited for a few years, I should never have had the audacity to wear it. Arunachala will call me back. More and more I dread Shantivanam. Where is the Lord taking me? They have renounced the world splendid. So, from then on, they belong to the Loga, the world, of those who have renounced the world. They constitute themselves a new kind of society and in group of their own, a spiritual elite apart from the common man and child with instructing him, very like those scribes and Pharisees whose attitude made even Jesus, the compassionate one, lose his temper. Then a whole new code of correct behavior develops, worse than that of the world, with his courtesy titles, respectable greetings, orders of precedence, and the rest. The wearing of sovereign becomes the sign, not so much of renunciation as of belonging to the order of swamis. Rare indeed are those who do not at least expect, even if they do not actually demand, to be treated with special respect on account of their trust. I was thinking this morning that if I could be convinced that Ramana was right, Nothing whatever could stop me from retiring to our natural, in total poverty, immersed in the inner life. Then I should no longer have my great source of embarrassment. This feeling of ambiguity of my Hinduism and my poverty being a mere facade. once again in a cave since yesterday evening. Here at least I feel in my element. There is no room at one and the same time for God and for myself. If God exists, then I am not. If I exist, then how could God be? The Hindu is right. God is within me, in my deepest and innermost center, where I am most truly myself. Going to meet God has nothing to do with going somewhere outside myself. Twenty eighth of March, nineteen fifty three. Such a strange but impressive meeting with Sri Arilal. Abandoned prayer in favor of a meditation. Abandoned study for thinking. Abandoned thinking for the void. The void for what is beyond the void. You say that you are a Christian. That is meaningless at the stage you have reached. You need only one thing. Free yourself from the last bonds which are holding you back. You are ready for it.
penetrate into the guha, the cave of your heart, and there realize that you are Tatvamasi. You are that. Alone with God, that means alone with yourself. Dare to face God in coming face to face with yourself. Advaita, non-duality, main doctrine of the Upanishads. It's a fantastic experience. He who is touched by this blazing light is transfixed, shattered. No more can he speak, no more can he think. There he remains, outside time and outside space, alone, in the very aloneness of the alone. Christian Sanyas, I am astonished to discover that by burying myself in the caves of Arunachala, I have penetrated to the very heart of Hinduism. The production now consists in making the round of a holy place on foot, keeping it always on the right side. This used to seem to me pure superstition and an outdated survivor from a distant past and from a belief which the course of history had long ago swept away. Later, I came to understand. I discovered a wisdom here that will remain intact when our so-called modern times have been quite forgotten. Last day on the mountain. Tomorrow I shall have to leave. I must accept a total immersion in the self. Even so, before my mass this morning, I softly intone the blessing of palms, sang the hymn, all glory, Lord, and honor. Nostalgia for a time that has passed away, like the joys of childhood to which the adult can never return. The abyss has swallowed me up too deeply. The abyss of the self. Gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this. Saturday morning, back to Shantivanam. Here I remain half asleep. How can I wake up again there? Time has passed. From now on, I have tasted too much of Advaita to be able to recover the Gregorian peace of a Christian monk. 
And in days gone by, I tasted too much of this Gregorian peace, not to be tormented in the midst of my Advaita. Why be so ill at ease in addressing Christ as my guru, the ferryman, the one who forced the river, Taraka? The essential problem, the church claims to be the only way of salvation, but the church is a fundamental obstacle between me and Christ, between humanity and Christ. What I have to lose, and yet I am scared, an ocean of dread, whichever way I turn. Supposing in Advaita it was only myself that I was finding, and not God. What guru will give me the light? Save me, whatever name it pleases thee to use in coming to me. Thou, who tearest at my heart, who can't be named. would religions be true, except at the cosmic or historical level? How could they do more than open the way into the mystery of awareness, the mystery in the depth of being? I no longer find comfort in the church, nor even any help, but no more do I have the right to seek these things in the Hindu myth. The Hindu myth, just as much as the Christian myth, must be left behind. Seventh feast of Saint Benedict at Shantivanam, painful occasion this year. I can no longer live here as a Christian monk and I am unable to live as a Hindu monk May the Lord take pity on me and cut short my life. I can't stand anymore. Why do I want so much to give a name to the mystery that is within me? Wanting to name it, that's my whole problem. Instead of naming it, contemplate it, be dazzled, blinded, be. Instead of naming it, be this mystery, for I am that, I am. Have I the right to say this mass, the mass crystallizes my inner struggle. In the gospel, there is much more than Christian devotion as ever discovered. So what to do? Just one thing. If the Christian mystery is true, it will be found intact on the other side of the Advaitin experience. December 55, meeting with Sri Gyanananda. The true Guru shows himself in an outward form, whatever that may be, at the right moment to give help in passing through the final stage.
can't get away from the strong impression that this man is truly my guru. I'd like to devote my whole time in future to thought-free meditation. All that he says seems to spring up out of my own heart. Enter to yourself, into the place where there is nothing, and take care that nothing else enters there. Penetrate within yourself to the place where there is no longer any thought, and take care that no thought arises there. There, where there is nothing, fullness. There, where nothing is seen, the vision of being. There, where nothing else appears, the appearance of the self. That's jhana. Without learning it from another, how would one know this? But it is not enough to hear it from just anybody. Great is he who can say this. Great is he who can hear it. Two weeks spent in a purely Hindu setting with Brahmins, no longer living next door to them, but sharing their life as one of them. Hymns sang round the sacred fire. Hinduism has an extraordinary sense of the divine playfulness in creation, but Christianity is tragic. The Advaitin can play his part in this world of illusion. Can he be a Christian? November 56, retreat in silence for 32 days. Gave every opportunity to my Christianity in the course of this month. Read the Gospels as much as, or more than the Upanishads. They were my only two books. Say the Rosary almost every evening made a force to blow up the mind so as to find the center, the unity. Got the idea that this was done. Sunday morning, went back to Shantivanam to say mass at 8.30. In this Christian setting, I become another person, quite different from the self that I am over there. On Monday, I had to go to the bank. How shameful. It increases my distaste for this place. Must begin a new life. As things are at present, the only alternatives open to me are Shantivanam and Hindu sannyas. Chapter 2 The Wandering Monk. As the Upanishad says, on the very day when a man discovers that he is free from inward attachment, he should immediately set out as a wanderer. My guru is not here. A marvelous opportunity to go out as a real sadhu, a wandering monk. Let me beg for my food in the nearby Brahmin village. In their eyes, I am a poor man who goes from village to village without a penny in his pocket. 
For us, it was a wonderment. He wore on his forehead the sacred ash and spoke of our rituals with deep understanding. Swami, I said to him, in your country, they make aeroplanes and so many new machines. Here, we only make our simple offering to the gods, and you are the one who is bemused. He replied, here is true knowledge, here is peace. Our son Shanmugan was a child, about the same age as this lad here. Shanmugan asked him, what is the devil? He replied, do not fear. Does the Lord who is in your heart not keep you safe? He loved our poetry and spoke very openly. We offered him a chair and sat round him on the ground. He stayed with us for four days. All alone in the night with a shiva linga. Alone in the half light, very close to the stone symbol. The darkness and silence of the night made this inner shrine even more numinous, a symbol of the cave of the heart. Linga, phallic symbol of Shiva, the Supreme Lord. The chamber of the Shiva Linga is called in Sanskrit Mulastana, Mula is the origin, the source. Stana means the place, abode. No one has understood the secret of the Shiva Linga, so long as he has not delved into Shiva himself, into that mystery which everyone bears in the depths of his being and which gives him no peace until he has succeeded in fighting release. Who is prostrating himself and before whom? Everything that is said, thought, seen, or even heard is merely the sign of him who is beyond all signs. This morning, once again at Arunachala, the door of my cave is shut but how strongly it calls me. Walked around the mountain, slept in the court of the temple. This mountain is Shiva himself in the form of a linga. The self, taking the outward form of a thief, has relieved me of my money. I should have totally missed the point if I had merely arranged for a money order to be sent here so as to restore my situation of yesterday. My friend in the temple is trying to persuade me to make my home like him in one of the colonnades and to live by Biksha, begging. Yesterday, Monday, made a pitiful attempt at Biksha. I like the courage to knock at people's doors. Nineteen fifty nine, first departure for the North and the Himalayas.
Until then, I had never realized the real meaning of poverty for Sanyas. I had always approached it in terms of my monastic vow. Instead of seeing it at its roots, it is a challenge to the very possibility of owning anything. Nothing to get, nothing to reach, to be free. According to the Upanishad, the true sannyas has rejected everything, he is avaduta, totally free. Digambara, clothed in space. The Kishi, the hairy one bears the two worlds, heaven and earth. Intoxicated with a unique self, he is called light. The silent ascetics, girded with the wind, wear garments soiled of yellow hue. Maddened with ecstasy, we have mounted the winds. You mortals can see nothing but our bodies. Some years later, I climbed up to the source of the Ganges. Whatever a man may be below in the plains, here is nothing more than a pilgrim returning to God, to himself, on the way to silence from which he has sprung. What does the road matter? Or the scenery? At the center of yourself, find the source of the self. The self at its source. So I ascended step by step along the course of the river, as if going against everything in me that seeks to escape into externals against my own desires and thoughts.
Hindu, when he prostrates himself before an idol, is aware that this idol is mere stone or metal, and that he must pass beyond it to find the reality which no worship can influence, no penance can gain, and no thought can discover. It lies beyond, and the way to it is within himself. How I wish I could never return to the plains and remain here, hidden in some cleft in the rocks, lost in the mystery of the Father and the Spirit. They give me a wooden hut in an enclosure reserved for sadhus on the other bank of the river. Then I enter the great silence. This Om, in which you reveal yourself to me through everything, it is the same Om which bursts from my lips, in which I call upon you, for who am I, if indeed I am, apart from you? The Eucharist is essentially the sacrament of this descent into the depth, of this ascent to the source, beyond the distinction of I and thou. Om. It contains everything.
There is only one source. There is only one birth at the very heart of being, that in which being is revealed to itself, in this place that is beyond all place, from which all comes and to which all returns. It is only at the source that meeting takes place, for all meeting is one. Man only meets man when he meets God. was simply watching the river flowing by. A naked figure came up to me and signaled to me to follow him. I made a sign to show that I was not speaking. He too was vowed to silence. How do you pass your days? You go to the river? Do you take any food? Do other sadhus come to see you here? How do you manage to communicate? The real Muni who has renounced speech is one who no longer has any need for speech, even within himself. If he still needs to speak to a god whom he imagines within himself, what is the use of his keeping out of silence? For that man, the Ganges was everything. The Ganges doesn't flow in order to provide irrigation. It makes no effort to irrigate or to fertilize. It flows. The sadhu is he who remains by the source. The dams and irrigation canals built downstream are not his concern. He has nothing to give but the gushing water which flows directly from the source.
Takashi, not far from the source of the Ganges, the biggest center within 100 kilometers from the Tibetan frontier. One kilometer outside the town, there is a small settlement of sadhus. I shall probably spend the greater part of my time there from now on. The first time that Swamiji came here, he came on a visit to Uttarkashi, not to live here. He liked the atmosphere and decided to remain here. He liked living alone in prayer and meditation. People said to me, you must help him. And I gave him this small plot of land on which his hut was built, just beside the Ganga. I have a hermit cell, a kutia, about eight feet by nine and six feet high, and a marvelous skylight looking onto the river. People expect ideas, but I would rather help them fear that what they need is to keep silent. Chapter 3, The Awakening. Deeply Hindu and Christian at the same time, I contemplate reality with two eyes badly matched, different in focus, differing in clarity. What makes this uncomfortable situation worthwhile is that I act as a bridge. If in order to be a Hindu with Hindus, I had become a complete sannyasi, I should not have been able to communicate either the Hindu message to Christians or the Christian message to Hindus. What is the meaning of stranger? The whole universe belongs to me, according to the Upanishad. What I felt most strongly in him was his love. In his way of respecting others, there was no desire to make an impression or to put himself forward. I found that he had come from far away to devote himself to spiritual research, just like people do scientific research. He was true to his own country and at the same time aware of the importance of the Ganga and the Himalayas. He wanted to reconcile science and spirituality. He came here as a young man and explored the Ganga in every direction. He wanted to make known in his own country that treasure which is rooted in us. The last thing that has to be done is to break through the final distinction between the one who seeks and the one who is sought, to plunge into the presence to quieten the imagination and silence thought, to allow the Ganges to flow on its way. Read and meditate on the scriptures but as soon as the light has shone in your heart, put them aside as you throw away the taper which has been used to light the fire. Mm -hmm. 
silence, even the thought of the presence. And then, the presence, like a flash of lightning, a seeing without a seer, no separation between the seer, the seeing, and what is seen. So long as I contemplate within myself a face of Christ, which is other than my own face, I shall never have a found Christ. The real Christ for me is myself, myself risen again. In light of that intensity, the eye of thought is blinded an intoxicating wine, which I'm afraid to share. It will turn everything upside down. only lips in a total vacuum. To be awake is man's natural state. That which is within the heart of man which knows neither birth nor death, neither division nor degree, only that, beyond all forms, should one adore. Yes, I think I'm speaking. Mm -hmm. Abhishekana is speaking to him, mm -hmm. and he is writing so that he is always keeping it. Swamiji was interested in the way of knowledge, Gyan Marg. Since meeting him, I too became interested in the way of knowledge, and I stopped believing in idols and gave up worshipping them. Today, Saint Benedict, I'm a little like him during the time when he lived on his mountain at Subiaco and understand his love for it. But there is also the call to speak, write, give my message, which comes to me from so many Christian friends. And I am torn apart between my solitary life in Utakashi and all that they would like me to undertake on the plains. The new Carmel at Kumla, the seminaries in Ranchi, Allahabad, Delhi, Hindu friends on the way, an ecumenical Holy Week at Jotiniketan. Next month, I shall have to go to Bangalore for the National Seminar, the Pastoral Council. I shall return via Bombay and Indore. I find this tempo quite shattering. Twenty second of October, nineteen seventy one, met Swami Abhishek Tananda. All that I expected, all that I longed for, was given to me. That afternoon, we went to the center of New Delhi. I told him that he was just like a hippie. He roared with laughter like a child. In your dream, you thought you saw me, the solitary monk lost in the mystery of the Himalayas. All a wonderful myth. Be free from every abode, inward and outward alike. With Mark and two young Hindus, I am experiencing, from the other end, what is meant by a guru, a human relationship which arrives at the deepest meaning of fatherhood. No one has the right to make himself a guru. I only became one when Ramesh arrived to make me his own guru. Why did you say it's only dream now? Uh, well, because uh, I know uh, I'm not going to get him. It's only a dream. 
Uh, well, uh, exactly, not exactly. But uh, even uh, if I find him, I can find only for myself. But the fact is that I have not lost him. So he's always there with me. But uh, the question is, for others, it is a dream. And as a man, to me, it is also a dream. But as a soul, I am always with him and he always with me. Am I right? It is only... I can express him... Nothing more than that. It has been troublesome. <laughs> I went to look for Mark on his sandy beach beside the Ganges after his three weeks of silence. In him I have found a real disciple without reservations. He wants to continue this profound immersion in the Upanishads, come what may. There I realized that the Upanishad is a secret which is only revealed in the direct transmission from guru to disciple. The essential truth of the Upanishad is the awakening to the Purush, the primordial man, the son of man which I am. Not systematic instruction, but flashes of light. The whole night spent in seeking this Purush, who remains awake when the whole world is asleep. This morning, mass beside the Ganges. I have no questions left to ask him. Pulchati, the little ashram in the wilderness, became in the two following years a place of awakening for Swamiji and for me. It was here on the way to Pulchati that there was a mighty outpouring of grace. Swamiji was overwhelmed by the mystery of the totally a cosmic man, the one who leaves everything like a madman, never to return, forever lost to the sight and memory of the men. For a brief moment, he simply tottered on his feet as if knocked off his balance by the glory caused by the overflow of inner ecstasy. I had to prop him up. It is too much for one to experience the presence of the real. It burns you up. It disappear, swallowed up in the source. I was settling down to study Sanskrit. Then the experience, like a flash of lightning. It is beautiful, true. That day, Mark was studying in his cell. Suddenly, the sound of violent sobs could be heard all over the ashram. I said to myself, something has happened. We knocked on the door. I called out, Baba, what is going on? We called him Baba because he was an elderly man. He replied, nothing. Go away. Be quiet. I thought, Today the Guru is giving the divine power, the Shakti which is in him, to his disciple. Mark, I have had a fever since yesterday. Pulchati was too much for me. It's fantastic, that light which drains everything out of you, destroys you. The Upanishads are true, but this discovery is a mortal wound. 
for you can only discover it in yourself on the further side of death. Om, that light. On Saturday, 30th June 1973, Mark took sannyas in the Ganges at Rishikesh. His entry into a double monastic lineage, Hindu and Christian. It was so beautiful, so powerful. The symbol recovered all its meaning. I have renounced all the worlds. I have risen above the desire for children, the desire for riches, the desire for any world. Rise up, O Purush. Open your eyes. You have received the gifts. Keep awake. Go, free with the freedom of the spirit, as far as the source from which none return. And he set off, no one knows where. What is he getting to eat? Where is he sleeping? He who came after me has gone ahead, and I can never catch up with him. I have only one message, the one which Jesus and all the seers have taught, the encounter with death, with God, and nothing else, whether bad or good, I found Mark again on 10th of July at the temple of Ranagal. The sadhu had gone away. On that day, I felt very strongly that I was performing a rite of transmission to Mark so as to free him from his discipleship. Farewells on the 14th, which unwittingly anticipated the final departure. Swamiji decided to go to Rishikesh just for a few hours. It was the words of a last farewell that came unbidden to his lips when he left me that morning. I am the Ekashi, the unique seer, sprang from the Himalayas in the Linga of Silence, the fiery Purush. Since the beginning, I have called you from the depths so that you may abide here in the place of origin. You are Shiv, the great liberator, the great destroyer, the symbol of death which mows down everything. I am the Kishi. We have mounted the winds. We have drank of the same intoxicating cup. 
I am the one seer who gives the one vision, taking a thousand forms in stone lingers and in ascetics to reveal my presence, to summon and awaken. I am going away, yet I remain here. I shall not leave you. I saw a man stretched out on the ground. His face was mud-stained. The taxi driver pointed him out to me and said that he might be a drug addict. I heard a whisper, Yvonne. At that, I recognized Abhishekthananda. It was joy that killed me. I knew I was tired. I didn't really run after that bus. I began to, then I stopped. For a long time, I have been pursued by this drive towards death. And yet there was something else, the angel of life, something in me which fought for my survival. Every time he opened his eyes, they were full of joy. He looked so radiant, happy, peaceful. It's beautiful. I can't tell you how beautiful it is. You only have to open your eyes just where you are. A marvelous impression of passing over between death and life. An existential experience that life and death are only particular situations. And that the I, the awakening, is neither bound to nor limited by them. Everything has become clear. There is neither heaven nor earth. There is only the awakening. Terrible lesson, the true death is that which cuts those knots of the heart which make a man identify himself with his ideas and his desires. The first night was filled with disturbing dreams. I was made to pass from cave to cave at different heights, and I replied, the awakening has nothing to do with pitting oneself against more and more difficult living conditions. At every moment of my life, in every circumstance, I awake. After a few days, a marvelous analogy came to me. I have found the Holy Grail. It is the self that we seek in and through everything. This is a supreme quest to which all myths and symbols are pointing. In pursuit of this quest, we search high and low, and all the time, the grail is right here. We only have to open our eyes. I know him, this great Purush of the color of the sun beyond the darkness. Whoever knows him passes beyond death. There is no other way to get there. After Abhishekthananda's death, Mark Ajatananda withdrew into his solitude on the banks of the Ganga to keep a ten-year vow of silence. Since 1977, 
No one has seen him.